Now that we've solved all the world's problems, today is the 24th of March, right? 324? Okay. Um, what we've been doing are basically ideal stoichiometric calculations. Stoichiometry, it's fun to say. Um, and, and this is like an idealized version of what really happens in a chemical reaction. We assume that everything goes perfectly. Every molecule that could possibly bump up against another molecule and react does so. Um, everything's moving fast enough. You know, molecular motion, of course, the more, the, the warmer it is, the faster the molecules are moving. This is kinetic molecular theory. Um, the faster they're moving, the more likely they are to bump into one another. When they bump into one another, that's when they react. They can't react with one another if they're on opposite sides of whatever your stuff is. So very often what happens in the real world is that reactions do not actually run all the way to completion. And I intentionally had you leave your test tubes with your evidence of chemical reactions, um, aluminum leaching out to alumina, zinc, uh, aluminum chloride, and depositing pure copper. Because if we had just dumped those after 12 hours, when you came in the next day, oh, 24 hours, I guess, um, the mass of aluminum, we should have collected the mass of aluminum to see how much aluminum you had generated, but that is going to continue to increase. So I went and I shook some of them up to get more aluminum exposed to more of the solution, and I don't know how many actual particles of zinc chloride are left in there, but it's possible that those things are continuing to slowly react. Most of the reaction has run, has occurred, um, but if you shut the reaction down too soon, then you may not get the full reaction. Um, when we do a stoichiometric problem, we assume that everything goes, and that's not usually the case. If, if some of you are going to end up taking chemistry in college, if you get the chance to take a class called quantitative analysis, quant, of course, refers to numbers. Uh, I would love to go back and take a quant class. Um, quant classes are basically just, it's a semester of all stoichiometry. It is all stoichiometry of, it's, it's basically chapter nine for a semester, you know, for 16 weeks. And one of the big things is lab technique because the, the guy who used to teach it at YSU, I think he still does, Dr. Larry Curtin, um, you had like three hours of lecture a week, but you had six or seven hours of lab time a week because you had, I don't know what, 10 reactions that you had to run, 10 labs in essence. The goal was that to get down to basically almost 100% yield on all of them. So you guys have done percent yields in here. When you were doing recovery um, from a mixture, you did pretty well. Some of you, you know, were spot on. When you're running a reaction, of course, then you're purifying your products and massing those. And in Curtin's quantitative analysis class, I think you had to get down to less than 0.1% error, or maybe it was 0.5%. What happened if you got more than that? You reran the lab, and you reran it until you got the result, and you kept rerunning it. And you kept so you want to guard against loss. You want to guard against. You want to make sure the reaction does run fully. So if the reaction has to run at a given temperature, you have to make sure that it's at exactly that temperature. That you maintain that temperature. If the ingredients have to be agitated, you have to make sure that you continue to agitate them. So there are a lot of little factors that can reduce your yield, and that's you know that's where. When we're doing just the numbers, we just assume it's all perfect, <laughs> which is very easy to do, but it's not true. We are really going to just talk about this conceptually today. We're going to talk about what are called limiting and excess reactants. And these are some of the things that can limit the amount of product you produce. Has anybody here ever baked cookies? Good, good. So if you're baking cookies and your recipe calls for three eggs and you only have two eggs in the house, are you going to make a full batch of cookies? No, you're going to have to cut your recipe back. That means the eggs were your limiting reactant. They limited how many cookies you could make. In a chemical <coughs> reaction, sometimes we don't have enough of one reactant to get everything else to react. We don't have enough molecules of aluminum 
to react with all of the zinc chloride that could react, or we don't have enough zinc chloride to react with all the aluminum that could react. So it can be called limiting reactant, limiting reagent, either one, but it's the thing that runs out. This is the thing that runs out. If there is one thing that runs out, there has to be something else that's left over. That is what's called the excess reactant or excess reagent. And it's just what's left when everything else has run out. So we are going to make soap in here, and I think we're probably going to make soap next week. Um, that's the way it's looking. But we're going to do some math practice with this first. So has anybody here ever made soap at home? Okay. My grandmother. I got to do soap making as a little kid with my grandma who was an old chubby little old farm lady and she would make soap after butchering because you'd have a lot of lard left over and she had she had these giant crocks she would keep in the basement with hog lard in them. It's great. And whenever she got a nice batch of lard, we'd make soap. And soap basically has three ingredients if you're making the simplest possible soap. Fat, lye, and water. So lye is sodium hydroxide. NaOH. And fat can be anything you want. Um, my grandma used lard. In here we've used olive oil. We've, we've used coconut oil. Um, we had somebody use argon oil one year. We've used soybean oil. We've used all kinds of things. You can make it from any kind of fat you want. Um, my grandma had graduated from high school. I don't think she ever took chemistry. She graduated from high school in, the in 1929. Um, if they offered chemistry, I don't think a lot of girls took it. So, she didn't know anything about stoichiometry. She didn't know anything about chemistry. Grandma just kind of roughly knew, eh, I use about this much lye, I use about this much water, I do this, then I stir, 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 and then I set it aside. And every now and then, so lye is drain cleaner. <laughs> it is nasty stuff. Um, when you make soap, you want to be wearing full eye protection, a full apron, good gloves. When I do batches of soap at home, because I make soap at home, I do it outside. I don't do it in my kitchen. Um, because lye is pretty dangerous, pretty nasty, pretty corrosive stuff. I have given myself lye burns. And it is a burn. It's like an acid burn. Um, it will actually take off layers of skin. Not nice. So when you're making soap... You basically only have two reactants. You have sodium hydroxide and you have fat. If you got the math perfect and every molecule of fat reacted with every molecule of sodium hydroxide, there would be no limiting and no excess. Everything is perfectly matched. But that never happens in the real world. So one of them is going to be excess. One of them is there's going to be some leftover of one of those reactants in your final product, in your bar of soap. Which one would you rather it be? Not lie. Yes, not lie unless you want to give yourself a chemical peel every morning as part of your beauty routine. Um, every now and then my grandma would make a batch of soap that she would say, well that one's kind of strong. <laughs> I now know as an adult and a chemistry teacher that what she in fact didn't understand but knew intuitively was that she had excess lye in that batch of soap. She had used too little fat. So in soap making, um, if you go on soap making websites and blogs and all kinds of stuff, and there's a whole big industry about making stuff yourself these days, which is cool. Uh, they talk about calculating for, what is it, percent plus fat. What they're saying is how much fat is left over in your soap. You want a very moisturizing facial soap bar? You plan for more fat in your soap. So we're going to do soap making next week, and by the time we get to that, which should be late, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess Thursday we'll make soap in here. I think we'll do soap Thursday, because um, we've got some calculations to learn first. Because you are going to calculate how much lye and how much fat to use. So you're going to make do the calculations yourself. So if you screw it up, guess what? Your soap that you're going to gift somebody you love with will burn their face off. <laughs> so, you know, maybe you have somebody you don't love so much who you would like to give a gift. No, no, no. Um, I will not let anybody take home soap that's going to burn someone. Um, when I gave myself lye burns, it wasn't from the final product. I 
screwed up in the process of cleaning some stuff up. And I got lye on my face, and it hurts. Um, <laughs> Because, like I said, it takes off a couple layers of skin real fast. Um, but vinegar takes care of it. Vinegar neutralizes it, and then it all stops hurting. <laughs> so I dumped vinegar on my face. Um, so we're going to practice some real simple calculations, doing limiting and excess. And then we'll move on. This is just like the other stoichiometry where we can do mole to mole. We could do mole to mole, mass to mole, mole to mass, and mass to mass. But really, with limiting and excess, we're only going to do mole to mole, just to kind of get the idea, and then we're going to go straight to mass to mass. Okay? So, for any kind of stoichiometric calculations, what do we have to start with? Given. Well, even before the given, our thermite talk. So, when did the Transcontinental Railroad go through? Who had AP US? A push. When did the Transcontinental Railroad? Give me a decade. I don't need an exact year. 1800, 1820, 1850, 1880, 1890, 1910. Are you serious? I am calling Mrs. Jones right now. Uh, 1830, that's canal era. What do they teach you people? Still! Okay. Uh, 1867, I believe. Post-Civil War, but just barely. Okay, so 18, let's, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll give me the benefit of some sloppiness and say 1870. So 1870, the Great Plains, North Dakota, um, you know, the great span of uh, all those rural, beautiful wilderness places, the prairies. When they're out there, welding track with a Lincoln Arc welder, right? How do they weld the tracks in 1870? Fire. <laughs> so have you ever melted iron in a fire? You ever had a bonfire in the backyard? Was it hot enough to melt iron? No. Build a forge. <laughs> build a forge. So every, every, what, 12 or 20 feet, they just build a new forge and they transport hot iron. This is sounding less and less practical. How did we ever get a transcontinental railroad? A <laughs> little forge on wheels on the tracks. Oh, but wait, you have to have tracks for the... I am seeing all kinds of problems. Chicken airplanes. and egg. Thermite. Airplanes. Yes, we dropped it from airplanes in 1870. Okay. So how do you join together sections of iron in 1870 in the middle of the Dakota wilderness or, you know, any of, any of these places? Nebraska. Super glue. With a chemical reaction. This is called a thermite reaction. So, what is this stuff? Iron oxide. Iron, iron three oxide. Um, what's the common name for iron oxide? R -r -r Rust? Rust. Have you ever seen powdered iron oxide? Yes, you have. <laughs> um, it's in a lot of cosmetics, actually. Purified. But a lot of um, reddish-brown cosmetics contain iron oxide dust. Um, iron oxide is this, you know, nice, dusty stuff. Yeah, you could be putting it on your face. Um, seriously. So don't do this with what's on your face. Um, can you powder aluminum? Yeah, of course you can. Um, you can powder most metals. You can, you know, grind them down. Well, it turns out if you take two sections of metal like this and you construct a hopper, Okay, so this is sort of a, an empty little chamber that sits on that joint. And you fill it up, and I'm going to color code these. You fill it up with, what would that be? The powdered aluminum, the sort of rusty colored stuff. And then I'll make the, um, or I'm sorry, the powdered iron, iron oxide. And there's some powdered aluminum, okay? And if we heat this thing up, and by heat up, I mean, holy smokes, like 4,000 degrees, light it on fire, like serious fire. That's a fuse, by the way. It's the world's ugliest fuse. 
Um, you have to use a fuse made of pure magnesium. Magnesium burns at, oh gosh, I forget how many thousand degrees Celsius. Super crazy hot. Hot enough that when that flaming magnesium, when that very high temperature reaches this little container with the powdered aluminum and the iron ore, it introduces enough energy to break this chemical bond and allow the aluminum and the oxygen to fuse. Now this is all occurring at like 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you now have molten aluminum, but what, guess what else you have? No, you have molten iron. And the molten iron flows, there's, there's like a little wooden plug or something in there that's going to burn out when the reaction goes through. That molten iron flows into here and cools and joins the two sections of track. Pretty cool. Um, so anyway, it's one of my favorite little reactions. I keep, I keep, in the old building I kept threatening, I said, I really want to run a thermite reaction. We could go out in the parking lot. We've got magnesium ribbon. We could do it. We could do it. Okay, so say, <laughs> I forgot to hit start. Say you're, you're welding track in North Dakota in 1870. You have 500 grams of each reactant. The question is, which one's going to run out first? So that's what a percent, um, well, wait, I, I promised we'd start with the easy ones, didn't I? Okay, let's start with an easy one. I'm sorry, I got all excited because I love thermite and I love limiting in excess. Okay, let's say you have, scratch the 500 grams, we'll get to that. Let's say you have 10 moles of each reactant. What do you run out of? Okay. How do we start one of these problems? Okay, here, here is my, my biggest tip for you. Like, circle this, highlight it, write it in orange, tattoo it on your inner arm, I don't care what you do. When you're doing limiting an excess reactant, you are always comparing reactants. That seems obvious and intuitive, but every time, every year, I have somebody on a test do a factor label that starts with a reactant and ends with a product. This is all about a comparison between the two reactants. Therefore, your factor label is going to involve two reactants. So, let's start off with our 10 moles of aluminum. You can start, and here's the other thing, you can start with either reactant. It does not matter which reactant you start with. You can start with one and then run it the other way and do the other. That's fine, but you always go reactant to reactant on these. So if we have 10 moles of aluminum, we're doing mole to mole. So what's our next step in any stoichiometry mole to mole? We're already in the heart of the problem here. We're going to, straight to a mole ratio. So we know bottom next to cancel will be moles of aluminum. And we know top will be moles of what? Iron oxide. Thank you for not saying rust. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, where do we get our ratio numbers from? You guys are all good at this at this point. From the balanced chemical equation. So we got two moles of aluminum reacting for every one mole of iron oxide. How many moles of iron oxide are going to react? Five. Now, everybody always, like I said, this is my eighth time teaching chemistry, I'm going to tell you where the pitfall is. Everybody can get the numbers. The hard part is knowing what the numbers mean. So if only five moles of iron oxide, iron three oxide react, is it our limiting or is it our excess do not answer yet? You also get these Ginzu knives. What you have to do is compare the answer you get here to your given. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a sentence that will 100% of the time. So what I'm going to do is I have a sentence for you. I've had this sentence for about six years. I didn't, I didn't do this the first few years I was teaching chemistry. Um, you will not have to write this sentence forever. <laughs> Once you're good at these, you'll never have to write it again because it'll just be intuitive. But starting out every year, I still write the sentence because it really helps clarify. 
here's the foam. Okay, we're gonna finish this on Monday, um, and this is this is where we will start on Monday. So have a good weekend, folks.